from every blade of grass to every stone that's unturned to every star that's in the sky to every cloud that we see pass over us the sun that shines the moon that we've had the privilege as a human race to walk on beyond that there's a God and the Bible says that he holds all of those things together everything that you witnessed in that video God is holding it together every second of every day and if he were to choose at any second to release himself from it everything would collapse and there would be chaos in the universe and there would be chaos on this earth that's the God we serve He's so much more than the, the box that we place him in and, and, and we open once in a while to say, God, I need your help with this and God, I need your help with that. Or we place him in a box and, and we give him orders and, and we tell him what to do and say, God, we want you out of the box now. I'm using you as I would my spare tire in my car. I only call on you when I need you. Or like a fire extinguisher that hangs on the wall. We only use it and check it out when there's an emergency. But he's so much more than that. He's God. He created all things. Without him, nothing would exist. As we are the crown of his creation... And he took pride in saying that the human race was the best of the best. When I look at what he's created, that humbles me to know that I would be considered better than any image that we saw on that screen when it comes to what is beyond what we can see with the naked eye that can only be revealed with a telescope. But God is out there. And God is right here gives us a new way of looking at the verse that says in him all things consist wow we need to increase expand our view of who God is some think he looks like father time some just see him as this king of heaven sitting on a throne with a long beard and a crown on his head. And he sits there with his son on the right side with a staff in his hand giving orders to the angels and rebuking Satan. Yes, that's true. He does do that. But that image of him is so wrong. He's God. And he's a spirit and he's everywhere at once. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all-wise. And as I said, any time he would choose to remove his grip from the universe, move, remove his grip from our lives, there would be chaos. There would be a mess. If you would please turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Verse number 36 is the key text verse to the message this morning. The reason for everything. When we get to verse number 36, let's say that together in a spirit of unity. I will read verses 33, 34, and 35. And then when we get to verse 36... We will say that together. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief. Excuse me, I'm in the wrong chapter. Oh, the depth of the riches, I'll say it off the screen. Wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord, who hath been his counselor, 
Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Say it together with me. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. When I think about that verse, and I think about the word glory found there, it causes me for just a moment to stop and think about what does it mean when I hear the expression or the statement, we should give God glory. What does it mean? Well, look at this. When I think about the reason for everything, I have to think, first of all, of again, for of Him and through Him and to Him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Everything comes from Him. Everything happens through Him. Everything ends up in Him. Always glory, always praise. For the universe owes its origin to Him, was created by Him, and has its aim and purpose in Him. To Him be the glory throughout the ages. Amen. The word amen has this definition. So ever let it be true. So when we say amen, we are saying, so ever let this be true. When we come to a verse in the Bible, and it concludes with the word amen, or amen and amen, it simply means, so ever let this be true. Do you believe that God created all things? Amen. Do you believe that in all things, God is in the midst of it? Amen. As God is in the midst of our lives, taking care of the hurts and the heartaches and the troubles and the things that we get ourselves into, He is also in the universe holding it all together for us. Look at this. You see, it's all for Him. All of it. The ultimate goal of the universe is to show the glory of God. It is the reason for everything that exists, including you. God made it all for His glory. Without God's glory, there would be nothing. What is the glory of God? It is who God is. It is the essence of His nature, the weight of His importance, the radiance of His splendor, the demonstration of His power, and the atmosphere of His presence. God's glory is the expression of His goodness and all other intrinsic, eternal qualities. Sometimes it's difficult for me to find the right words to say when I'm asked to come speak for certain events. For example, I I've been asked to come and speak at the Mogador Christian Academy's commencement services this coming week. And as I've been thinking about the words that I want to say and the challenge that I want to give the seniors, sometimes the thoughts do not come to the pen and I have a difficult time writing down what I want to write down. And even more so when I think about God. Even more so when I try to describe God and share what God's glory means. Because when I think of God, I think of how without Him, I wouldn't be here. And without Him, I'm nothing. Look at this. Where is the glory of God? Just look around. Everything created by God reflects His glory in some way. We see it everywhere, from the smallest microscopic form of life to the vast Milky Way, from sunsets and stars to storms and seasons. Creation reveals our Creator's glory. In nature, we learn that God is powerful and that He enjoys variety, loves beauty, is organized, and is wise and creative. When I was a child in school, you know, we didn't have a lot of the modern technology, obviously, that students have today. And I remember the first time in science class, it was the fourth grade, that someone brought a microscope to school. And as we looked at the different slides underneath that microscope, I saw things that I had never 
ever witnessed before. For example, a blade of grass looked different under the microscope. An insect looked different under the microscope. I remember placing a flea under the microscope. You couldn't hardly see it, but we got underneath the microscope and began to magnify it. I looked at a flea and I thought to myself, wow, in that little flea there's design. And even though intelligent design wasn't even thought of then, I did think to myself, God, how awesome you are. Because even though I couldn't see that with the naked eye, you could see it with the naked eye. And then I remember another student bringing a telescope to school. And we were able to stay after school and watch the sunset and the moon take its place in the sky. And, and we took that telescope and we shot it up into the heavens. And the things that I saw with that telescope proved to me that there was a God. And that God was more than just what some people defined Him as being. That He created all of that. And now we have things like the Hubble telescope, which now circles the earth and, and takes pictures and photos of galaxies beyond even our galaxy. And at the end of the service this morning, I want to show you what the Hubble telescope found at the center of the universe. An amazing thing. Because no matter how many times the atheists and the agnostics want to say that there is no God, God always has a way of proving that He is here and that He exists. We have a God that we can worship knowing that He is who He says He is and that all His acts of creation reveal his glory. Look at this. The Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmaments showeth his handiwork. Throughout history, God has revealed his glory to people in different settings. He revealed it first in the Garden of Eden, then to Moses, then in the tabernacle and the temple, then through Jesus and now through the church. He was portrayed as a consuming fire, a cloud, thunder, smoke, and a brilliant light. In heaven, God's glory provides all the light needed. The Bible says that the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for God's light is the glory there. Can you imagine if you had a way to illuminate your home without turning on a light switch and never have to pay another electric bill, what that would be like? Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome to know that we could do away with um, Dominion, East Ohio, and not have to worry about paying that gas bill anymore, that fuel oil bill, or that high electric bill because our home's all electric? Yes, some will put wood burners in their home, but you still have to go out and cut wood or get coal and place it in that wood burner to have heat for the winter. But what if there was a way to take care of all of that and you never had to cut another piece of wood, shovel another lump of coal, pay another Dominion bill or pay another fuel bill we would all do it wouldn't we well guess what when we get to heaven we're not going to have a light switch we're not going to need anything to keep us warm for God's glory will take care of all of that God's glory is best seen in Jesus Christ he is the light of the world and that light of the world illuminates God's nature because of Jesus we are no longer in the dark about what God is really like. The Bible says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and Jesus came to earth so that we could fully understand God's glory. We are told in John chapter 1 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory and that glory was full of grace and full of truth. God's always spoken the truth to us even when it hurts. Now I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I don't want to raise my hand. But how many of us have ever told a lie? <laughs> we got it. Look at that. It's embarrassing, but we've lied. We've lied because maybe we were caught in something that we did not want to be held accountable for, responsible for. Or maybe we've lied just because at the time it seemed like the thing to do. Maybe we got a laugh out of somebody who bought into the story that we just told. And we laugh about that. But you know what? God has never told a lie. He cannot lie. It goes against His very nature. He always tells the truth. And when we accept the truth, 
the glory of God shines in us. I remember watching that movie, A Few Good Men, with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson. And Tom Cruise was asking Jack Nicholson some questions as he was on the stand. And Jack Nicholson perked up and became very angry and said, you can't handle the truth. And you know what? That's true in some Christians' lives, isn't it? You know, I could take some of you to an evangelistic crusade where the pastor or evangelist could preach. You could walk out of there going, whoa, boy, was that good. That was awesome. That was powerful. Others would go and say, I don't like that guy. He offended me. I didn't like at all what he had to say. But the bottom line is, the truth has to be delivered. It may not always come in the package that you want it packaged in. But we should appreciate the person who's willing to deliver the package. They're God's mailman or God's mail person. God's inherent glory is what he possesses because he is God. It is his nature. We cannot add anything to his glory just as it would be impossible for us to make the sun shine brighter. But we are commanded to recognize his glory, honor his glory, declare his glory, praise his glory, reflect his glory, and live for his glory. Why? Because God deserves it. We owe him every honor we can possibly give. Since God made all things, he deserves all the glory. Look at this. Imagine, if you would please, attending a sporting event or maybe a musical talent show and someone close to you is involved in this talent show or this musical event or this sporting event. And they were going to announce at the close, at the conclusion of all of this, the best of the best. And you were keeping track. Maybe you were writing your own notes and you were watching the other athletes as they participated or you were listening to the other musicians or listening to the other singers perform. And you knew that your son, your daughter, someone close to you was right at the top. And at the end of that, to your shock, to your astonishment, the MC of the night announces the winner. And out of the crowd comes this person that you've never seen before. This person did not participate in this event. And the MC says, let's give this person a hand clap of appreciation for a job well done and receiving the gold medal tonight. And you're thinking, are you kidding me? See, we don't honor, we don't give glory, we don't give praise to someone who hasn't earned it. Right? That's why we worship no other God than Jehovah God. He deserves all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Not Muhammad, not Confucius, not Allah, not any other idol made out of wood, not any other idol made out of gold, not any other idol made out of silver. There's only one God deserving of praise and glory and honor forever and forever. And that's the Lord God Jehovah, Lord God Almighty, the Lord God who sent His Son Jesus to come to this earth to die on a cross so that we could have salvation. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the entire universe, only two of God's creations failed to bring him glory. Fallen angels, demons, and us, people. All sin at its root is failing to give God glory. It is loving anything else more than God. Refusing to bring God, glory to God is prideful rebellion, and it is the sin that caused Satan's fall, and it will be ours too. In different ways, we have all lived for our own glory and not God's. Look at this. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't know about you, but there are times when I begin my day and I walk outside and the sun is so bright that I think to myself, I need to go back in and get my sunglasses or I need to kind of keep my head down so that I'm not blinded by the light. You know, God's glory is so powerful that we cannot look upon him in our condemned sinful nature. 
That's why we need Jesus to come into our lives, to remove the sin that's there, so that we can look at God face to face and behold His glory. What did the angels announce when Christ was born? Glory to God in the highest. Once we recognize God as one who deserves glory and praise, then, says the scriptures, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Sometimes we lump that all together and not understand how that falls piece by piece into place. See, none of us has given God the full glory deserves from our lives. This is the worst sin and the biggest mistake I believe that we can make. On the other hand, living for God's glory is the greatest achievement we can accomplish with our lives. God says they are my own people and I created them to bring me glory. So it's so important in our lives that we bring God glory. Look at this. How can I bring glory to God? Well, when we think about glorifying God, we have to remember the words of Jesus. Jesus told the Father, I brought glory to you here on the earth by dying and by doing everything you told me to do. Jesus honored God by fulfilling his purpose on the earth. We honor God the same way. When anything in creation fulfills its purpose, it brings glory to God. Birds bring glory to God by flying, chirping, nesting, and doing other bird-like activities that God intended. Even the lowly ant brings glory to God when it fulfills its purpose it was created for. God made ants to be ants, and he made us to be us. He made you to be you. I wish I could have one of those microscopes that I had that's even archaic now from when I was in the fourth grade and passed that around to you so that you could see a blade of grass this morning and a flea as I saw it. And you would see that God is in every detail. And you know that God's in every detail of your life? He loves details. Saint Irenaeus said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. There are many ways to bring glory to God, but they can be summarized in God's five purposes for my life and for yours. Look at this. Number one, we bring glory to God by worshiping Him. Worship is our first responsibility to God. We glorify God by worshiping Him. C.S. Lewis said, in commanding us to glorify Him, God is inviting us to enjoy Him. God wants our worship to be motivated by love, thanksgiving, and delight, and not duty. John Piper notes, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Think about this. You love your children, your children how to love you, no matter if they're babies or grown adults. But when there's tension, that means there are problems. Therefore, there's a root cause to all of that. And if you don't take care of the root problem, then the answer will never come to you. In other words, God wants us to want Him. And if there's a problem between you and God, then your relationship will never be complete and you will never find satisfaction. Worship is far more than praising, singing, and praying to God. Worship is a lifestyle of enjoying God, loving Him, and giving ourselves to be used for His purposes. Think about it this way. You need to lose a few pounds. I'm going to start my diet tomorrow. I'm going to start it tomorrow. Now, I can start my diet tomorrow by saying, I went to the store, Walmart, and they had a sale on Slim Fast and Dexatram. I said, boy, Ron's serious about his diet. But you know what? That's not a diet. Dieting is a lifestyle. Right? I have to choose to change my lifestyle. Worshiping is just not coming to church and doing God a favor on Sunday morning. Worship is not bowing your head in prayer throughout the week and saying, God, it's time for me to meet you. I'm doing you a favor. Worship is not opening your Bible and saying, I really don't have time for this and don't want to mess with this, don't really see the need for it, but God, I'm going to do it because I'm supposed to. That's not worship. Worship is a lifestyle. You see, we exist for God. God doesn't exist for us. When you use your life for God's glory, everything you do can be a, an act of worship. The Bible says, use your whole body as a tool to do what is right. For the glory of God. Now, 
men have toolboxes. For some, every man knows what every tool is used for in that toolbox. Other men, they open the toolbox and don't have a clue what those tools are. They're as new now as they were the day they were bought. But in that toolbox, there's a tool that can meet the need of something you are working on. You see, God uses us as a tool. We are human beings to do a work, a necessary work for him. Look at this. We bring glory to God by worshiping him. We bring glory to God by loving other believers. When you were born again, you became a part of God's family. Following Christ is not just a matter of believing, it also includes belonging and learning to love the family of God. John wrote, our love for each other proves that we have gone from death to life. And Paul said, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, then God will be glorified. You know, not everybody's going to have the same attitude about things in life that you do. Not everybody's going to look at things the way that I look at them. Not everybody's body is going to be identical. Even identical twins have differences. There's something different about them. Maybe a personality trait. Maybe one has a character flaw. Maybe one's just a little bit taller than the other. Maybe one is a little smarter than the other. Even though they appear to be identical twins, there are differences. And so God says there's going to be differences in all of my creation, especially the human race. Even the blade of grass, it all looks the same, but yet grass, even though it all looks the same, you go out there and look at that, some grass will be taller, shorter, wider, skinnier. Some grass will be dead. So there's differences in God's creation. And God wants us to accept the differences. In other words, there's going to be those whom you may look at and not like for whatever reason. You need to be careful of that because God made us who we are. Did you know that by studying the 12 disciples, that each of those disciples has a personality that is found inside of every church today? Some have the personality of James. Some will have the personality of Peter. Some will even have the personality of Judas Iscariot. Some will have the personality of Thomas. Some will have the personality of John the Beloved. But inside of every church, you will find a personality trait that each one of the disciples had. Jesus chose men from different backgrounds, different personalities, to do a job that the world is still feeling the ripple effect of 2,000 years later. They established the church, and Jesus said, upon this work will the church be built. It is your responsibility to learn how to love as God does, because God is love and it honors him. Jesus said, as I have loved you, so must you love one another. Look at this. Number one, we bring glory to God by worshiping him. Number two, we bring glory to God by loving other believers. Number three, we bring glory to God by becoming more like him, like Christ. Once we are born into God's family, he wants us to grow to spiritual maturity. What does that look like? Spiritual maturity is becoming like Christ in the way we think, feel, and act. The more you develop Christ-like character, the more you will bring glory to God. Some have said, I know who you work for. I know who you've been trained by. I know who your teacher was. I know what church you go to. I know who your youth pastor was. I know who your parents are. All because these people invested their life into them, and because they did, these people took on the personality traits or part of this person's characteristics that was training them, so it became obvious who these persons, who these people were trained by, were educated by. And so when we read our Bibles, and we choose to bring God glory and honor, it will be obvious to others that we're growing. And somebody may say, hey, where do you go to church? And it just kind of flows out because you're so filled with God. We bring glory to God by becoming like Christ. God gave you a new life and a new nature when you accepted Christ. Now for the rest of your life on earth, God wants to continue the process of changing your character. Look at this. We bring glory to God by serving others with 
our gifts. Each of us was uniquely designed by God with talents, gifts, skills, and abilities. The way you are wired and the way you were wired and the way you are wired is not an accident. God didn't give your abilities to you for you to use for a selfish purpose. God gave you your talents so that you could use them to glorify him and to benefit others. Think about it. Now, I'm sure that maybe if Henry Ford had not made the first automobile known to man, I'm sure that in time somebody else would have made a car. But God designed, wired Henry Ford to be creative. And because of that, look at what we have in our society. God wired Thomas Edison to be creative. And because of that, we are able to illuminate our homes. God wired Alexander Graham Bell to be creative. God wired you the way he wired you, and he wants you to use your talents, your gifts to bring glory to Him. And no better place to use those gifts and those talents than inside the church. It's not uncommon to know that churches have built buildings by the people that worship in that church. Because inside of that building there are carpenters, there are electricians, there are plumbers, there are men and women who will put their best foot forward by being servants and, and do whatever is necessary and help in whatever way needed in order for that church to grow and be built. There are those whom God has blessed financially. And because of that, those individuals have been able to give a little more to the church. But God wants to use all of us. And God wants to use you. Now look at this. We bring glory to God by telling others about Him. God doesn't want His love and purposes kept a secret. When God came into your heart to live and you became a Christian, God did not whisper into your ear, now keep this a secret. This is between you and me. I don't want anyone else to know. No, we're told to go shout it out, to go preach it. The word preach means to proclaim it, to show forth some energy with what's happened, what you've experienced. It's to dig deep down inside and let what's inside burst out. So that others can say, wow, what's going on over there? I know sometimes we give analogies of sporting events and we will say, boy, people aren't afraid to show their expression there. But in church, it's hard to get a holy grunt out of them. And some will say, I don't understand that. Well, I do. I understand that because we have been conditioned to believe that in church we are to be more holy. We are to be more refined. But you know what? Sometimes we just need to let it out. We're talking about God. We're talking about His glory. We're talking about His creation. We're talking about what He has done beyond this life and what is forever, what has forever been settled in heaven, which is our eternal salvation by the blood of Jesus on a cross. We bring glory to God by telling others about Him. Once we know the truth, He expects us to share that truth with others. And I close with this. What will you live for? Look at this. What will you live for? Living the rest of your life for the glory of God will require change in your priorities, your schedule, your relationships, and everything else. It sometimes means choosing a difficult path instead of an easy one. Even Jesus struggled with this, knowing that he was about to be crucified. He cried out, Father, my soul trembles, and I'm troubled. Father, if this cup could pass, let it pass. You see, Jesus stood at a fork in the road. Would he fulfill his purpose and bring glory to God, or would he shrink back and live a comfortable, self-centered life? And you face the same challenge this morning. Anytime the word of God is preached and proclaimed, you're challenged to continue as you have, or to take your best foot, step forward, and do something for God. We serve God. We serve Jesus. We serve the creator of all 
Will you live for your own comfort, your own glories, and your own glory, or will you surrender today to Jesus Christ? How many of you remember that was with us on the first Sunday? I showed a video clip of an evangelist by the name of Lou Giglio. And in that video clip, we were shown by Lou that our DNA, our very makeup, that which holds us together, is a cross. You see, God has a way of always revealing himself even to the one who is the skeptic, even to the one who's the atheist, even the one to who's the agnostic. Now, I want you to watch this. Tom, if you turn his lights off, please. Just turn the lights off. The magnificence of God. Watch this. God's watch what they found at the center of the universe. Look at this. Uh, you remember the darling of astronomy, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And I just searched Whirlpool. A list of uh, names of images came up. One of them was called the X structure at the core of the Whirlpool Galaxy. Got my attention. I thought, okay. I clicked on that link and a photograph comes up, an image comes up on my computer screen, almost knocks me off of my seat. I cannot believe it. I'm just staring at it with my mouth open. It's 31 million light years away. The Hubble Space Telescope, seeing what we cannot see, has looked into the dark black hole core of the Whirlpool Galaxy and sent us back a photograph. Here's what NASA sent us back from 31 million light years away, deep in the core of the Whirlpool Galaxy. We get this image coming back to us Wow it's the X structure in the core of the Whirlpool Galaxy I'm not here to scientifically tell you it's a cross. You can make of it what you want to tonight. I'm just saying it reminds me of the Revelation writer who said, it's Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It's Jesus everywhere. It's grace everywhere you turn. It's mercy when you least expect to find it. It's God laughing in heaven when we finally got the Hubble aimed at the right place. And he goes, check this out. It's me. It's grace. It's mercy. It's kindness. It's forgiveness. Everywhere you look, it's God saying, I love you. There's grace everywhere. And long before you decided what you were going to do with God, God decided what he was going to do with you. I know there's probably someone here this morning saying, but Ron, you can make something out of anything. That's true. We can make something out of anything. But you know what my response to that is? God made something out of nothing. God has a unique way of making sure that the most intelligent person on planet earth to the one who has been least educated know that he is real. The smallest form of life reveals God. The most complex form of life reveals God. The sun reveals God. The moon reveals God. And in the center of the universe Millions and millions and millions of light years away through the black hole is the Hubble telescope revealing to us that there's a God. Our DNA is a cross. The center of the universe, the Hubble's telescope says, on that planet is the image of Jesus Christ. I believe that it's God revealing himself to this generation in a generation that's educated, that is forever learning, says the scriptures, and wanting to know the truth, but yet they look everywhere to the truth except to Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to share the truth with you. 
Jesus is calling. Jesus is tenderly calling today. Whatever your need may be, would you let Jesus take care of that need? Would you sing with us this morning now? Jesus is tenderly calling. Jesus is tenderly calling to home, calling today, calling today. Lie from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam, farther and farther away. Calling today. Calling, tenderly calling to 